And um, since we have mostly action items, we need one more person. We're going to go ahead and uh, let's run down to the uh, reports first, and then we'll get started with the uh, audit after that. Uh, well, first of all, are there any public folks that want to have any public comments? Nope. All right. Brad? Um, the, uh, Debbie, you're going to do this? Next? I will do the reports, but I will actually take this moment, since we're taking a few extra moments here, to introduce some new people in the room. Uh, Julie Lupus, if you would please stand up for the committee to meet. She is our new Director of Accounting. She has just recently been promoted, and she's been here since October of 2014 and has been doing a great job. So you'll be hearing from her more in the future, getting some reports out. We, go, we also have back there another Julie. We've got dual Julies going on. Julie <laughs> Cagliastro, right? And Julie to number two is our new IT director. She hails from the New York City area and has recently moved down here, so we're very happy to have her. Very nice. Welcome so, to the area. Yeah. Yeah. We're still working out the logistics of who's Julie one and who's Julie two. So we're happy to have them both on board and doing more. And this is going to also allow Michael to spend, as you know, with our, what's our biggest item we're discussing this year? The budget probably in the years to come. So this will help alleviate some stuff for more data analysis and more um, work on the budget process. So with that, we'll take a look at the monthly uh, financial performance reports where we're reviewing the month of January. And on the first page here, as you can see, we have a surplus of almost 3.8 million compared to a budgeted surplus of 3.2. So $524,000 favorable to budget. Uh, we're pretty much on target for all of our revenues. Uh, property taxes just due to timing, $160,000 under budget. But the one thing I'd really like to point out here is under the expense side, one of the things that's a positive that's driving the piece of this, if you look about the third line down, the supplies expense. If you remember, we had previous month, um, I think it was the previous month, but we had reported that we had um, repairs that were done to a bus that had been in an accident. The repairs were significant enough that it's really extended the life when we rebuilt the bus. So we have now pushed this over into the capital side of the house. It was 100% paid for by insurance proceeds. This put my whole staff into a flurry of redoing financial statements, keeping Andrew up at night, I'm sure. But we were able to do that because it was the proper thing to do. And it's a rare thing that we have an incident that causes that much damage where it's not totaled. Um, so that's what's driving it there. If you take a look at the next page, which is the year-to-date summary, you can see we're about on target to budget. We have a surplus of $28.4 million compared to a budgeted surplus of $28.2, $230,000 positive variance to budget. Um, once our property tax revenue it catches up, that's worth $433,000. That's a timing difference from the way we budgeted for it. I have, this is my early prediction, it's not the brackets for the basketball games, but my early prediction is we will be favorable to budget this year. And you can kind of see we're, we're partway through the year already, and uh, I think we'll end up a little bit favorable to budget which is a budgeted deficit of 1.7 million. You know, you've tasked us with trying to close that gap entirely. We're trying to work towards that, and it's some of the discussion items we'll be having later today in planning as well. So other than that, we are under budget in just about every area, working hard from the staff level to contain expenses. And I would entertain any questions on the financial statement. Okay. Um, the other report um, is at your places on the, the ridership and other um, on ship six. Uh, and so far for the year, we're uh, just a little bit overall up for the year, up one percent over last year. So we're kind of like plateaued, uh, pretty much. And uh, you can see kind of below some of the uh, different things. We're, we're very, we're significant increase on the St. Pete. Um, Looper, uh, and and a slight increase on the Jolly Trolley. <coughs> Any, I think we we 
of course, track all this stuff and um, we're tracking the trends. We're looking at what's happening in the month of March already um, with our with the Toronto Blue Jays uh, park and ride lot up at Dunedin um, going pretty well, and then the um, trolleys over to Clearwater Beach, funded by the city of Clearwater, um, and the ridership looks pretty good on that too. So, what's the um, uh, explanation for the, uh, the drop in the on-time performance? Anybody I'm sure there's some, it's pretty significant. Yes. Well, we're checking on the no well. There's, there's, there's one known um, explanation, but we've already, I've already, I saw that, and um, we're checking on the number. Um, about six months ago, um, we determined that we were not counting our on-time performance uh, according to the definition um, that we had agreed to, to in order to benchmark ourselves against the other 22. 25 trans systems that are in our benchmarking group, and namely that we were not counting if a bus was early, that it was not on time. Um, which, as Mr. Cox knows, and I know, if a bus is early, that is just a card, that's a terrible sin, and um, it is not on time. It's very bad, because then everybody misses the bus. Uh, so now we are, we are going back and now re showing you the on-time performance, including um, including early buses. And so the 69.1% um, on-time performance we think is accurate uh, for this year. The 77.1% for last year. You look, I'm sorry, I was looking at 66.4. Oh, yeah, you're looking at 66. Yeah, oh, you're looking at the year to date. Oh, I'm sorry, okay, that's cool. Um, Okay. Right. So, every single month so far this year, um, in in order to try to show apples to apples, we're going back and showing the previous. We're recalibrating the previous year's number to be the same, showing the earlys. But the earlys can't be that much early, are they? Or? Yeah, uh, we're, we've actually identified that we have a, a real real challenge with early some locations early. being early a lot. Yeah. Um, and um, so it's dropped our average on-time performance, which used to be hovering around in the 80s, right. or 85, to this 66. Um, we've got a whole campaign going on with the drivers and everything about uh, not being early. But anyway, I don't think that 77.1 from last year has been recalibrated. Um, so that's the reason for the... So if they're early, they don't wait till they're on time? They they pick up whoever's there at that time and go on? And yeah. Can they stay early all the way through? Is that? Potentially. Potentially. Um, of course, uh, it gets a little complicated because at the very end stop of a route, nobody ever complains about it being early. I mean, you don't complain about getting to your destination a little bit early. Um, so we don't want to count that. But they, then they do have to sit there and wait and depart on their next trip mm -hmm. on time and not early. So we're, um, we're looking at ways in which the data has been collected over time to make sure that we're collecting the right metric, essentially. Um, but yeah, um, we're, we have a whole campaign with our operators about emphasizing the importance of being, not being early. Um, so it'd be the, the complaints going up would be reflective of that, probably? I mean, it seems like the complaints. Possibly. I mean, uh, if, well, if you're missing a bus because it's early, my God, that would be, a, like you said, a cardinal sin. <laughs> Since probably the next one's not coming for another hour. Yeah, yeah, yeah. right. Well, um, airlines, airlines have that flexibility. They tell you to clean up the gate at a certain time yeah. and 10 minutes before. For a bus, it's a different story. Right, right. Um, I don't think, I mean, I noticed also the complaints is up. I don't think that's... Um, I don't think this issue with the early is a new problem. I think we're just, uh, the data um, is now reflecting it. But I think the complaints thing is maybe largely due to our discussion um, about reducing service. Because mm -hmm. we, we are getting mm -hmm. an increased number of comments. Um, that's what I think is the uh, reason.
go ahead and get started with the audit report, and not not that does not give you carte blanche to extend it too long. <laughs> but just you know, go ahead and get get us started. I don't believe he'll be talking pension as much this year. No, <laughs> might be OPEP. But. Do you want me to bring up your? Sure. Well, I apologize, first of all, for the, the timing of this, being in NCAA tournament basketball fever, but I guess I told Mr. Eggers I will move as quickly as I can up until the point where we need that additional quorum to accept the, uh, the report. But I just have about 20 or so slides move along in the next 15, 20 minutes, but of course, <laughs> <laughs> entertain questions as, as they come up. Um, so why don't, we, why don't we get started? So just to start, I'm Andrew Laughlin, principal with CLA, Clifton Larson Allen. I have overall engagement responsibility for ensuring the time of the completion of the audit for the fiscal year end of September 30, 2018. I do have a colleague that uh, is joining me here today. This is Lance Schmidt, also a principal in our Florida local government group. Uh, I'm giving him a more deeper introduction. I'm going to hold off until the end of the presentation and, and uh, let Lance actually come up here and speak for a bit. Uh, Here's the agenda that I have, the very quick, brief, let's go watch basketball agenda. Um, as, before I go through this, let me just give you a quick status update of where we are on the audit. So the good news is the audit is substantially complete. But substantially complete is an audit term, just like materially correct is an audit term. What does that exactly mean? It means all the way correct, all the way complete. We are very, very close to complete. There was just one open item that we have on a grant uh, a specific eligibility testing that we're performing on a grant that should be done momentarily and then at that point we can finalize everything at least on our end of course pending review and acceptance uh, from you all so that's the good news the audit is essentially done um, minus this one one issue but uh, through my review the uh, comprehensive annual financial report the CAFR has been drafted presented to you all uh, in, in essentially near final form so we'll just look through real quick who the engagement team members on our side that contributed to the completion of our audit procedures, the reports that we have that are embedded in that CAFR document that'll be delivered. Uh, we'll talk a little bit on internal controls, things we found, any deficiencies or anything, or recommendations on improvement. We'll go through those. Uh, every year throughout the, each audit, we try to do a little something different to kind of spice things up so we're not doing the same audit procedures over and over and over. There are obviously many procedures that we have to do the same every year to meet our minimum auditing uh, standards, but we also try to find things that we can look at that maybe we haven't touched uh, in such detail in previous years, and so we'll talk through what those procedures were that we performed this year. I'll give just a very quick financial statement overview, just a few highlights of some major revenue and expense accounts that changed from last year's CAFR to this year's CAFR draft. And then at the end, we'll talk some future transition plans, which kind of leads into why Lance is here today. So the engagement team, uh, again, introducing myself, Andrew Laughlin, principal, I had overall engagement responsibility. We had the financial statement single audit team. This is very consistent from what we had last year, which is great. I assume that management appreciates that to have. Yes, uh, <laughs> yes we do. You can see by the nodding of the head. Uh, Kim Pobletti, senior associate, she's really the rock behind all of this that gets it done. She's very experienced, works really well with, with management. We're very fortunate to have her, as I'm hoping uh, management feels the same way. But uh, Kim is, our, is my superstar that really gets it all done. Uh, Joe Baltera also have, uh, is really starting to specialize in local government, even at the associate level. So it's great to have Joe working under Kim. Sue Pagan, the director, performing all the detailed review of all the files and the, and the work papers. And I'm the one that's standing up here trying to take all the credit. We also have an IT audit manager, Jim Barton, that did the general and, uh, um, general controls review and application controls of all the IT systems. And then we also have an NTD agreed upon procedures team. It's going to consist of me and Joe Baltera that will be working very closely with Julie Lupus on finishing uh, throughout the month of April. So generally, that that work commences after completion of the financial statement audit. So this is no different than the reports that we delivered prior year. So independent auditors report, uh, we tend to have any unmodified opinion. That's good. That means all the numbers, everything in there is, is uh, material, uh, no material misstatements with any information presented within the CAFR document. 
Internal control report, good news there, no material weaknesses or significant deficiencies that we identified in that report. Single audit report, <coughs> uh, good news there, we had no material instance of non-compliance in the federal and state grants that we looked at. We did have a couple internal control comments that I'll share with you as well as other, other matter that also relates to the internal control uh, comment, kind of embedded in one. So two comments overall in the single audit report, and we'll hit those in some future slides. Management letter, no uh, pressing issues to report here, no deteriorating financial conditions, uh, despite maybe the CFO sometimes being worried, um, but nothing to report there in the management letter. Uh, we did have one in, in recommendation on around surrounding internal control to improve financial management. I'll report that in a bit. Examination report, that's your report on compliance with uh, your investment policy and ensuring that your investment portfolio is in line with what the policy dictates. We had no findings to report there, so an unmodified opinion on investment compliance. Governance communication, this is a letter that we'll be providing to you all, to, to all board members. Uh, so it's a required communication under auditing standards just to report, and we have none. No disagreements with, with management. If there's any significant accounting policies, we do have one on this OPEB implementation I'll cover. Um, any major corrected or uncorrected misstatements, we had none. So, um, pretty standard letter that we issue and no, nothing surprising to report in that letter. So we did test some more uh, made, uh, federal and state programs that we have in the past. Uh, last couple of years, it's been two to three programs that we've tested. Uh, this year is four, and that's just based on how things play out, both on how much the authority spends, expends in, in dollars and in an annual basis on specific grants as well as what we've captured in previous years is both what we call type A major programs and projects that we select at the federal and state level. So this is the way it played out this, this, this past fiscal year. We had one major federal program that we tested, the Federal Transit Cluster, and then three major state projects, the Florida Commission for TD Trip and Equipment Grant Program, Public Transit Block Grant Program, and the Public Transit Service Development Program. So that was the, the single audit work that we did this year. So internal control analysis, like I said, we had no uh, any no internal control matters of a, of a significant nature to report uh, over financial statements, but over grant compliance, we did have a couple. One was a reimbursement that was uh, uh, submitted and received uh, for the Federal Transit Formula Grant uh, for the purchase of tires. And so for these purchases, it was the vendor was Michelin, uh, sales tax was actually included on those invoices and had, had been for a period of a few years. Uh, it was actually discovered in previous years, but not, not correct as it should have. Um, and then we identified it through the course of our audit and because there was a um, reimbursement that was received that included sales tax, that's not an allowable cost technically under the, under the um, federal rules. So um, that was to the tune of $4,471 that we noted, I think, a total magnitude, it might have been around 20,000 or so um, in total. So our recommendation here was just to get work with Michelin to refund uh, those sales tax charges that were included on those invoices throughout history, um, get that refund, and also sub, um, remit those reimbursements for those sales tax charges that were remitted to that federal agency, remit that back since it's not allowable cost. That'll take care of the the corrective action on that specific incident. And then of course, just have heightened awareness and scrutiny of those vendor invoices. And this does happen periodically and typically does uh, does get identified by authority staff when this, when this happens. So this, I'm comfortable as an auditor that this was a more isolated incident. There was some, some unique factors relating uh, to this particular issue. Generally that does get, this does get identified if it's seen on an invoice and typically will either the authority will either request the vendor to provide a new invoice without the sales tax charges or they'll just short pay that vendor which would be the full invoice amount less those sales tax charges that's typically what happens this one just got missed what what, what happened with the continuous years of not doing it what was the issue there you said there was been going on for several years sure do you want me to I, no, I could, and when this became to light during the interim audit you know, we immediately got on to seeing what was going on to request the money back, and it did go back to the beginning of the contract. 
when when the invoices started coming in. So that's something we have requested going back to the beginning. Michelin has acknowledged that it was inaccurate on their part to ever have invoiced us. So now it's just a matter of if they've agreed to that, of giving the money back. So as far as internal controls for us, but on an internal being able to control, catch them, that kind of thing. Yeah, normally I think on those invoices, and correct me if I'm wrong, there's things like excise taxes. There's other things on that invoice, and it honestly, it just got missed. You know, yeah, got it. So I don't have any other explanation. No, no, it got missed back to the start of that contract. Right. Now you've got it and mm -hmm. go back to clean it up. Because yep. that is something that we do look for on everything as a general statement, even including on um, you know, expense reimbursement forms for people who are traveling. We just allow the tax. Thank you. The next piece is just on EPLS verification. So this is the need to not only perform this procedure is also maintain documentation that it happens. So this is whenever the uh, PSDA enters an agreement with a vendor to provide goods or services that will be federally funded. Um, so that non-federal entity, which is PSDA, needs to ensure that that vendor is not a suspended or debarred or otherwise excluded party. And there's a very simple way to do this. The U.S. government maintains the system for award management. That's the SAM at SAM.gov. So you can go on and ensure in the, in the EPLS or the excluded parties list system that that vendor that you were about to uh, contract for, for goods or services uh, under this federally funded contract is not a suspended or otherwise excluded party. This is a, a standard part of the, the procurement process. This was just one where we found an instance where we were through our audit procedures that we didn't uh, see that documentation within the file. So uh, management's aware of it. Um, so corrective yeah, action. Did you? Yeah, that's, oh, it, there was something in the file. It was after the purchase order was issued, which was based on an audit that Al did of our own files. And he can, everybody can blame me for this one. Al wasn't here. I signed <laughs> off on the purchase order. We keep a checklist in each uh, federally funded file. But I didn't ask for the whole file to take a look at to verify that if something's checked off at the backup was in there. So we yep. now know that I'm not trustworthy to do anything while Al's right. out of the office. Well, the Al just doesn't go on vacation. Exactly. <laughs> That's my point. Or lock him up here. So, you know, to that point, what we're going to do is most of these federal purchases are not emergent emergencies. Right. It'll be either after Al is, you know, back that something gets signed off on, or in the event that something needs to move forward uh, expeditiously. What I will do is just ask for the complete file to come with the purchase order so I can not only look at the checklist, but look at the backup documentation. Yep, thank you. So the next one, this has this has nothing to do with single audit. So as I mentioned, we had a, a management letter that we issued that were there any um, recommendations around internal control that, that didn't result from a, a, a significant deficiency in material weakness we might put some recommendations in the management letter. And so we have one here on time card approvals. Uh, the reality of the matter is that, well, in, 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 in theory, uh, there are all time cards for all employees that need to be submitted to payroll for processing you need to go through a review process within their electronic, the, the authority's electronic timekeeping system. That's in theory. In practice, that is not always practical because you can have situations where a supervisor will be on vacation and then a um, the time card might need to be what we call be force approved just by payroll uh, so that payroll can be processed because you don't want to hold up payroll processing for 600 employees because two or three people didn't get their time cards approved. Totally understandable. So what this recommendation centers around is just having a, 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 a system to verify after the fact, after payroll has been processed, go back to those individuals that didn't have those time card approvals and get with their supervisors to ensure that happens. So it's just maintaining a um, generated report that will denote exceptions in the approval process and then obtain that document approval from the applicable department supervisors. So just having a, a, a verifiable system to make sure that nothing gets missed. And this, we were, when we were going through audit procedures, we did select some employees and found three that did not have um, their time cards approved. And so then that approval process happened after our audit inquiry. So we just want to maybe formalize that, that process a little more within payroll to be able to go back to those um, departmental supervisors and make sure that that approval takes place. And then there's also just education and training amongst departments to make sure, to ensure that they know, hey, this is 
we take this seriously, that you, know, you need to make sure you're getting this done. So this is the one remaining uh, open item on the on the audit. So I can't speak for the results of this procedure, obviously, until we conclude on it. Um, but there's the Commission for Transportation, uh, there's TD, or Transportation Disadvantage TD grant that we're working on. So there's an eligibility testing that we're trying to wrap up and get completed. And it's just a matter of, of maintaining, you know, obtaining the necessary uh, paperwork for individuals that utilize this service. Uh, which includes both an application for a TD program and then some sort of in income verification that it, uh, ensures that they are eligible for this program. So we're still awaiting uh, uh, completion of that and provide us with the documentation. If the documentation isn't sufficient, then that might generate an additional comment or a single audit section. So I just want to make sure you're aware of that. So, um, you don't, so you know, I did present all the findings and all of a sudden something pops up that you so this is about just a sample of it was a sample of 40 if they are going through the process to allow them to take advantage of the uh, RTD program yeah the sample of 40 to verify that the proper eligibility documentation is maintained by PSTA for those individuals that we sample to ensure that they are eligible to participate in this program you, you, you haven't found a problem you're waiting on that result or you did find a problem and you're waiting for a response which we haven't found an exception per se. The, the process has been a little more elongated than than, uh, than we were hoping for. So it is, it's, it's, the process is dragging a bit, but I, I can't speak either way if there's going to be exceptions or not. So that's, I don't know if Debbie or if you or anyone wants to. No, I know they were working on it yesterday and we had not heard back by the end of the day yesterday. I'm not quite sure what you mean by that. Working well, there's a. There's individuals that they've selected in their sampling that they need to see the documentation that they meet the eligibility requirements, and I believe this is for our TD agencies, like Neighborly Care, our, mm -hmm. those agencies. So those agencies are to maintain that documentation, and that's what we're trying to get from them as the backup. Okay. The, the, the 40 individual documentation may not be in this building. Got it, it may be at these other it. nonprofits. Got it. We don't know. Them. We're, that's what we're, we're checking. Yeah. Okay. We're finding out. Okay. They're supposed to be there. Mm -hmm. yeah. Other verbal recommendations, these are just things that in, in the course of our audit that didn't amount to, in, in our view, a necessity to include in the CAF or in any of our reports, just things we discussed with management. Uh, use of positive pay, we've talked about this one with, with them uh, last year. There's just an some administrative processes need to happen to make sure the positive pay file is correct and can get uploaded with, to the bank. And so uh, PSTA is working on that with the bank to get positive pay in place uh, in the near future. Other one relates to uh, the DART program. And so I'm gonna actually table that one, that discussion for this next segment, which is just on our element of unpredictability. This was around the DART program. Um, that's what we uh, really took a, a hard look at this year than in years past. So we did, I believe, four or five specific tests on this, and I'll just kind of run through them. And then one of those tests uh, yielded this recommendation that we that we made to management. So what is the, the DART program? This is uh, uh, allows individuals with a disability um, to that cannot ride the PSTA bus to um, they might be ambulatory, ambulatory with walker, or wheelchair. Those are general categories um, that they can take. Um, well, PSD actually outsources this service to a third-party provider, which is Care Ride LLC, that, that um, picks them up and drops them off. And it uh, maintains those accommodations for those individuals with the um, disability so they can safely get on and, um, and off in the bus. So with that, we need to make sure that Again, this is kind of an eligibility type of issue. Make sure that all the that these individuals are in the master data, uh, master listing, um, have all the right documentation to verify yes, they're either ambulatory or they're with walker or they're wheelchair, um, and that way we can then cross check against the invoices that are uh, submitted by Care Ride to make sure that we have only eligible individuals that are taking these trips and that, we're, that the PSD is not getting potentially overcharged. 
So we just ran through some tests. Test one was the top 10 individuals that were not included in the master listing. Um, it was challenging to try to match those up because there's not an identifying number for each individual. So we had to match by name and you can have some variations of a name from the master listing that is retained by PSTA, the database that PSTA uses to maintain the listing of all the individuals that are eligible for this program compared to the invoices and all the invoice detail and backup from the third party provider care ride that includes the names and the number of trips and all that. So we try to uh, uh, compare those files and see, make sure that there's nobody that was in one listing but not the other. We did find some um, and then screenshots were, be able, were able to be provided from the master database. So there was some difficulty actually extracting a report from the master database that included everybody. So this test was a bit challenging, but this is how we got through it. We just picked it, got the top 10 individuals and made sure that they were in the master listing and they were. Then we had calculated fares. So there's four different fare types for each uh, ambulatory and for wheelchair. Um, the management did determine that they were accurate. We didn't actually see a, um, a, a signed, executed signed uh, fare or schedule from care rides. So that's one thing we would suggest. There's escalation clauses each year, so the fares will uh, vary from year to year, but I might just recommend having an addendum to the agreement on an annual basis with care ride to say, okay, here are the fees that are being charged, assessed for this year, and it makes it for a much easier audit trail. But we didn't find any discrepancies, per se, with the fees when we presented those uh, four different fee types of management. Then this next test was just to make sure that there was no individuals taking an excessive number of trips in a given day. So we combined all the monthly data from CareRide, the third-party providers. This is rather voluminous. We used our data analytics software to be able to mine through that and pick those individuals that took uh, the most number of trips per day. So we had seven instances of six trips in a given day. So those individuals were a little busy that day, um, getting on and off um, the bus. Um, and in each instance for that, we, the next pickup location did match the previous drop-off location. So it would go somewhere, and then the, the pickup location matched the previous drop-off. So I can see that. There were only two instances where um, that did not correlate. And so uh, the authorities actually individually work with called that into those individuals just to make sure that they had that those were legitimate trips and they confirmed that they were so we didn't see any abuse you yeah, I could just speak to that too also um, generally I mean, you're right I mean one point like to the bank and then to the bank to the drugstore drugstore maybe the grocery store and so forth. yeah but sometimes I may go to a little shopping mall or something like that too. right and especially if they're on a scooter, they may go to a different, you know, address that's very close by. But sure. They will, when they book the trip, they will identify that's what they are doing, you know, and be the same spot that they just got from. So, yep. No. And that's, you know, the big purpose of this is make sure, well, there's no fraud in the, in the, sure. in the billing from Care Ride, right? Do they have one person that took 64 trips in one day? Well, then that's either a billing error or they're fraudulently billing. PSTA for trips that didn't occur. So we didn't see any evidence of abuse here. There was some high, high volume, but as you said, it's, it's certainly explainable. And then the authority actually called these individuals and, and verified it. So then the last test we did here on mobility status. So the concern here is that wheelchair trips are more expensive than the ambulatory trips. It's more accommodations than we made, so that's obviously <coughs> sensible. But the concern is if we have, if say we if the authority has in this master database listing these individuals as let's say ambulatory with walker but not wheelchair that these individuals are being charged a wheelchair rate is there some funny business going on with the billing from care ride um, or what what's this what's the story so we did find um, we created a top 10 list of those individuals that their status was, let's say, ambulatory walker, but took the most number, either volume or dollar, based on do dollar amount or volume. I'm not sure what our, our threshold was, but generated that top 10 list. Uh, and we made a phone, uh, the authority made a phone call to one of those individuals who confirmed that she does receive wheelchair trips throughout the year. And she took 662 wheelchair trips 
that year and zero ambulatory trips, but she's listed on the database as an ambulatory with longer. So my recommendation here is just to is just to have a, a, cl a clear policy around that. We can, you know, it's understandable that you can have uh, one of these individuals that maybe can no longer. Uh, well, I think I can speak to that also. Sure. Um, and this is in coordination with the DART program with Ross and Tom. And there's some individuals that are on a walker. They can't get into a, a car easily. So a wheelchair, a van will be dispatched and take them up on the lift. But they're to be billed at the um, ambulatory rate for that too, not the wheelchair rate. Um, yeah. And that was in agreement with DART and you know, PSK. We had, we had those requests. Some people, some, or I should say Care Right had those requests. That, um, please send a van for this person simply because of their mobility status and they can't get into a vehicle that they can go up a lift safely and then sit in the next I don't know if um, that was clearly defined. But that's how, you know, how it's handled. Right, because this was. But Andrew, you said that, that the ninety-five thousand dollars was. Um, Those are all wheelchair. They rates. were billed as, as wheelchair, wheelchair trips. And we had that individual. That shouldn't happen. I mean, right. That, yeah, that should not happen. So. Right. And I, I would look into that. I would have someone look into that. I mean, if somebody's ambulatory, they should not be billed. So to conclude, we didn't we didn't perform a DART audit per se. Again, it was just a, a part of our things that we were trying to mix up and incorporate our audit. And this was one of them that we took a little extra careful look at. So yeah, like you said, probably one thing we want to look at the ambulatory versus wheelchair status compared to what they're getting built. Uh, just a few things on the financial statement overview. Uh, the authority adopted GASB statement number 75. That is uh, on OPEB. That's other post-employment benefits. This is all actuarial mumbo jumbo, just like we had in pension, where there's no real defined benefit that's being paid out to retirees. Um, that's that the authority is on the dime for. This is um, these are just the retirees that are, that are allowed to stay on the authority's health plan, and that drives um, the, the cost of the healthcare costs up, and so that portion that's related to those active employees that will eventually retire is, is an assumed benefit that we need to uh, uh, show a, a cost for and an expense and a liability. And so that's always been measured. It's just been measured under a different GASB statement number 45. It was always actuarially determined, but now the rules have changed and now it's GASB statement number 75, which is uh, required for adoption in fiscal year 18. So, uh, the OPEB liability, ironically, was um, actually 2458441 Now it's actually gone down under GASB 75, which you don't typically expect. But there was also other deferred inflows of resources reported of 792646 So the net of that did push beginning net position down when the authority restated its financial statements by about 200 and something thousand dollars. And so not a significant impact. Uh, pension was when that restatement occurred, and those those liabilities are more significant. So this OPEB liability isn't significant, but it is an accounting change that did occur. And we had a lot of fun trying to figure it all out and get it reported, reported and disclosed in the CAFR, as Michael Hansen can attest. Just a few larger variances to go over. Property tax revenues did go up from 41 million to 45 million. No change in millage rate from 17 to 18. That was all just an increase in property values, um, which is 89 billion to 97 billion from FY uh, 16, 17 to FY 17, 18. We had a special project assistance, uh, state grant revenue that did go up from about four to five million, almost a million dollars. Two big factors there. I listed four here. Uh, two of them were just increase in the TD grant that we were just talking about earlier. Um, and then a service enhancement program that started in 2017 but had only four months of activity and then a full year of activity in 18. And then we had capital grants and other related revenues. Those were to fund bus purchases and the, the bus purchase cycle for the authority is in similar annually. So you have one year with larger bus purchases and, other, and another year with less and that's what 
case here. So those, the grant money that funded bus purchases was higher in, uh, in the pre previous year than in the current year, to the tune of $10 million. So more spent last year and more revenue from grants to fund those purchases last year. On the expense side, operations, we had a smaller increase, but $2.3 million, a lot of it just went the majority, almost a million, went uh, increase in revenue vehicle operator, bus operator, salaries and fringe benefits. T purchase transportation, that also increased. So that's what we were just talking about with the DART program. So we had some more significant DART program costs um, and also increase in services from Jolly Trolley. That increased that purchase transportation number by almost $2 million. And then lastly, in administration <coughs> finance, that was almost a million dollar increase. That was <coughs> wages, fringe benefits, computer software services, and then also consulting services for this uh, 2018 community bus plan update that was performed by a, a service provider, and that was a one-time cost in FY18, I think to the tune of about 400 something thousand. So those things contributed to about the million dollar increase there. And that's all I have in the financial statements. Any questions on that? If not, I'll just uh, end the presentation with just kind of more, of more formal and detailed introduction of my colleague, Lance Schmidt. Uh, I've been actually taking on a new role within my firm, taking on more of a, a consulting and outsourcing focused role, specific focused on local governments. Uh, and that started earlier uh, this year in 2019. I came on continuing to pursue that. So then my audit duties are uh, getting shifted to others in my Florida local government practice. So I'm not walking away from the audit. What we're going to do, our plan for next year is to introduce Lance Schmidt uh, to the audit team, me having, again, overall engagement responsibility, but specifically on the financial statement audit side, Lance would head that up. I would stay as the audit principal on the LB NTD audit work that we're going to be doing in April, and I would maintain those duties. Again, have overall responsibility for the entire engagement, but then also bring in Lance to assist with the, with the financial statement audit as well. And, so with that, I also want to just bring him up here real, here real quick so he can introduce himself and give a little bit of background on, on uh, uh, what he's done and where he's been and where he is today. Sounds good. I appreciate the introduction, Andrew. Um, as Andrew mentioned, uh, I am a principal with CLA um, in our Florida government practice. And so what that means is uh, I spend all my time working with organizations uh, just like PSTA. And so um, as Andrew said, uh, he's not going anywhere. Um, he's, he's still here. Uh, he'll still be working. Uh, with PSTA and, and uh, certainly uh, working together on kind of transitioning and making sure that there's a, a seamless transition there. You know, our kind of our uh, our motto at CLA is creating opportunities, um, and that means creating opportunities for our clients and for our people. And I think uh, you know what what Andrew's talking about is is really the culmination of that. You know, is how how do we how do we better serve our clients, but also uh, again creating those opportunities for um, Andrew and others in our team to kind of do some uh, unique services that are really going to benefit a lot of. And so we're pretty excited about that opportunity, and it's certainly going to be a, a transition of us working together. Um, uh, you know, we're, this isn't a, you know, Andrew sets something down and walks away and I come in and pick it up. Um, you, you, you'll see Andrew probably again at some of these meetings um, as we move forward. And so uh, we're definitely excited. I'm a, a Florida native and, and familiar with the area. I grew up not too far from here, uh, in Pasco County. Um, but again, I reside here in Florida now, and I'm really looking forward to uh, getting to know more about PSDA and continue to work with uh, Debbie and her team. And uh, it's a pretty exciting opportunity, so I do appreciate it. So you're welcome. Thank you. I'll entertain any questions if you all have them. Um, just, I guess, back, back to the, um, the DART program, uh, our relationship with care. What's your general thought? I mean, I mean obviously, there's not concern here about fraud we didn't find any any potentially fraudulent billings or other activity but with the activity that we've got going on there and the, and the increase in business and activity it almost seemed like that's an area that we need to be very mindful of so these things that you're talking about um, I guess uh, we have the internal system in place to be able to closely track what's correctly being billed or is that what we're kind of talking about that we need to brush up on? Uh, I'd say the, the, the authority has the means, the, the data is provided, right? So those are some of the procedures that we were able to do. I'd say 
you can see where in my recommendation where there could be some cleanup and maybe additional investigation is just on this, the status of those individuals and the trips that they're actually taking. And there might be valid circumstances as to why someone designated as ambulatory walker needs to take wheelchair trips, but I just didn't see enough just structure and, and around that to, to really understand, you know, here, here are those scenarios where that makes sense and here's where they don't. So just maybe tightening up in that area and then just tightening up the oversight of it. So these audit procedures that I'm, that I'm doing, let's maybe do those periodically uh, as an organization um, to, to be performed by an, an analyst or whoever that can, that can run those types of tests and just make sure that there's nothing that's amiss and do it kind of on a regular basis. Okay. And, and you mentioned in the beginning that there was a little difficulty matching clients between Cameride and the PSD database, but does not each client have a client number? Unfortunately, no. And that, I, I would have loved to see that. That would have helped my auditor, Joe Balterra, quite a bit. Yes. And so that, I, we've, I think we talked about that, about yeah. potentially providing the unique identifying identifier numbers to okay. each individual so that they can provide back, here's the ID number for each of these individuals. Well, I know in the Care Rights database, they can, they can say, I'm client number 6932. Sure. The operator puts it into the computer, and boom, their name pops up. Right. And so if they have those ID numbers, and let's bring them into our master database. So that we can show them. We, our care line gets those from the PSDA. When they send over, you know, let's say the month of May, they sent over 400 new applicants, you know, approved applicants, and they'll send over the client, all the client's data, you know, their inventory, so on and so forth. Their address, any specific comments they may be not able to see whatever, and a number. There's a That's what I thought too. There, there is a client number. Do, do we, um, do we qual qualify yes. the providers? Yes. Okay. Yes. Good. Okay. Yeah. And then we basically say to care right, these are your qualified writers. Yeah, no. They right. identify them in their system, and then we're saying that getting that information back, no, we're not getting back. Well, because yeah, you know, uh, care right bills PSDA for every trip. So it's very important. Yeah, the person calls up, says, uh, "I want to apply for DART. Yeah. Uh, here's my doctor's note. To I call PSTA. We say you're good to go. Here's the care ride number, and then we never talk to them again. Mm. And then, except we see their bills for the trips, um, and from care ride. From care ride. Mm -hmm. So we, it's very important that we both keep the database to know, you know, um, and especially since." There's those different different kinds of um, cost rates for ambulatory versus wheelchair. Um, we had never done any kind of a, analysis like this before, and Andrew and his firm, CLA, <laughs> they they ask uh, Debbie every year for um, what what um, in depth analysis could they do, and we we found um, we've done different things over the years, um, and it was like you said, since we noticed the big increases in DART. And we're looking at ways to mitigate that cost. We picked Dart, so I think it's really great that it what is, you came up with. I, I, agree, I agree with that too, and I and I also agree with that. It may look suspicious that somebody's writing seven times in a day, but there are individuals that are really they're cognitively challenged, and they like to write, you know, to go to the farm store and then go here and go there. And go there. I just want to make sure. And there's no restriction on that. You can't restrict them. You can't restrict someone to write a box for them. But clear, you know, clear on the process of so this person, let's say that once that ride mm -hmm. today, they call here. Mm -hmm. they when, call when, once they're approved as a care ride rider, they just call care ride. And care ride has the approved list. Mm -hmm. and they say that person's approved for a ride, so out, out they go. They come to do the ride. They bill us yeah. for that. And at the end of the month, we find out that Brad B. Miller um, took seven trips in one day. Mm -hmm. And we and, and there's a way to confirm with our riders that they're indeed doing that service. Yeah. Like, is that is that an yeah, you can just call call yeah. call, call the pe individual people? Yeah. Did you really ride seven times this month? Or okay. how, how do we know that there are, the care rides actually delivering on the service that they? Well, for that test too, yes, yeah, someone. Um, 
in that department did call. There's two individuals that took separate trips. Essentially, did you take them? You know? and, and yes, we got confirmation. But is there is, is there enough of that done, in your opinion, checking to see that the billing that we're getting has actually been incurred? The um, I mean, it's you could certainly do more random random audits of, of, of calling individuals. Well, I don't know what's normal and not normal to do, but it seems to me in an area that's exploding in use that it just invites right. potential problems. That's all. I don't. Know. I, I think you know. Um, I think that. I mentioned the data analytic data analytics on all of this, whether it's done through CLA, whether it's done through us, just spending time, taking a look at it, taking a look at the software that we're using that made it maybe extremely challenging for someone to do this. It's extremely challenging for CLA. It's got to be extremely challenging for us as well. So I think there's a lot of things we can look at to improve upon so that we can do self audits and to do even more than we're doing today to ensure these things. Because when we see large numbers like $11 million for purchase transportation, which includes DART and Jolly Trolley, et cetera, we have to start looking at all of that a little more closely. Not that we aren't looking at it now, I just think we need to take it to the next level. So when you say a self-audit, it's really just auditing what's going on right. with our vendors, perhaps, right. a little more closely. Yeah. Scrutinizing the underlying detail in those invoices, right? That's it. I like that. The way you said that. That sounds a lot better. It's, it's the way I said it. Yeah. The, um, and to clarify one other thing, too, that person who took the seven trips that day, they didn't just have the same vehicle driving them everywhere because there has to be a 45 minute lag between each trip, all right? Meaning, right. Um, so you drop them off and then somebody has to come 45 minutes later. Uh, it could be the same driver if they're in the area, they do another trip or whatever. But uh, that's the dark. We actually have a meeting, we have a couple of meetings scheduled next week with with the care ride management team to look at all of these issues. I mean, there's a lot of questions about whether PSDA approves too many people, well, whether there's a way that we might, that's what care ride thinks, the care ride thinks we send too many people over there approved uh, that they have to provide. Um, so we're going to look at that, we're going to look at maybe, maybe there are ways that we can make efficiency so they don't have to take seven trips in one day times 30 bucks a trip. Um, well, they, I don't think wheelchair does that much, but I think more ambulatory does. And each, also, each driver does keep a written log of each trip, too. That could be audited as well. And, um, but that was good. I mean, that was, in my opinion, that was very good. Yeah. I appreciate it. Yeah, I always appreciate that. Yeah, thank you. So this is, this is an action item that's on the list for today. We do have a quorum now, okay. which is to approve the audit report and recommend it to the board for final approval. Of course, by then we will have the answers on our uh, TD eligibility yep. by next and, week. Yeah, I think the idea is that we were accepting yeah, the, the report, the, financial um, report. The, the, the audit report today um, with obviously some of the issues that you've raised. Uh, we're not, I don't know, we're not approving no. the audit. We're just You're recommending it to yeah. go to the board. Yeah. Perfect. I've, I've moved to uh, okay. recommend this to go to the full board. Second? I'll support it. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. We're good. Thank, Thank you. you. Right. Thank you. Uh, Thank just, you. Uh, yeah, just a minute, just a couple of questions in general. Sure. Um, and I don't, you know, want to take too much time here, but um, financial health, and from your perspective, I mean, I know you're, you provide an audit, but the financial health of the, of the organization, general comment, especially as it compares to last year, how we've moved. Um, and then based on what you're seeing uh, in the last couple of years of operation, what, what do you see in the next, you know, three to five years um, as far as uh, operational trends, <coughs> on asset, you know, net worth, you know, the whole thing? What, what are your, Ill prepared to answer that question, but I'll do my best. As part of our audit, we, it's a requirement in the Florida Auditor General Management Letter, we do a financial condition assessment. I'm not happy to share those results, but we go through key metrics, ratios, 
uh, looking at uh, even uh, benchmarking amongst other similar, uh, similar entities as well as prior year prior year's trends. And then um, there's actually a standardized template that the Florida Auditor General produces that uh, you enter in all that information for each map type and then it gives an overall favorable, unfavorable, or inconclusive. I can actually look up the results, but had we had an, an overall unfavorable rating, then we would have reported that on the manager. So just kind of my own confidence that was going through that that iteration, there's nothing that we see that is a significant concern to the as it relates to benchmarking or as it relates to our own trends? Is that what you mean? Both. Both. So it, it takes into account everything. So um, we go through that analysis both on the benchmarking side as well as the uh, prior year's ratios. And I'm, again, like I said, happy to share that. That, so would, be, that would be good, I think, for yeah. me. And that, to have that for this, for this committee anyway. Okay. Let me do that. I'll, I'll send it to you, uh, Debbie and Michael. Perfect. One final comment that you may, again, it may not be in your purview, maybe more directed here. We're, we're going through this exercise in the county to find additional funding sources to help uh, PSTA uh, operate, uh, not only now but long term. Um, and I saw in your report, again, it seems like everybody around here, not just PSTA, but everywhere says we have no debt. Everybody's proud of that, that we have no debt. There are times when debt when rates are pretty low um, that sometimes debt buys you some time. And so I'm just wondering as it relates to the benchmarked group that we look at, um, does anybody debt finance at all at some levels to buy time? We're looking at different scenarios now that we're, we're going through 2022 and if we do something we go 2023 or 2024, I'm just wondering if that's a jump in a little bit on this. The debt financing you see, uh, especially whether it's transit organizations or oftentimes in government organizations that you see, are bond issuances that relate to the building of infrastructure. And that's where you need the time to do that. You know, to basically you're, you're, you're raising funds and paying it back over time. I don't think it's, it's, it would raise a red flag if you were borrowing to fund operations. I uh, wouldn't want to borrow yeah, operations. But, More on the capital but side. But on the capital side, that's where you're seeing it. It's usually bond or it would be bond anticipation notes you know, or something like that. I mean, there's certainly equipment leases where yeah, equipment, equipment leases financing. make sense. The, yeah. the question maybe you're asking is, okay, how about on leasing versus purchasing of buses? Yeah. And I can just, I mean, I can speak from personal experience with other entities. I mean, hard to Sarasota area transit. I don't see that heavily used in practice lands. I don't know if you have. Yeah, I think I think one of the challenges that transportation agencies typically have is that the majority of their funding is not, you know, or the, you know, their revenue sources. Uh, what you bring in on the top line is only covering about 14 or 15 percent of all your operating expenses. And so oftentimes those big purchases are coming in through capital grants, which are usually one-time events. Right. And so if you lock yourself into some type of long-term bond, right. it's, you have to have some other revenue source besides just your own revenue right because it's there's Got no guarantee it. you're going to be able to pay that over time so i think that's a i mean it's generally what we see with organizations where so you in this kind of case in this place you probably look, look more at the um the the campus correct so you value evaluate the campus at correct. 20 million dollars or whatever the value is and then try to um, get some funding for that as a source I mean, Potential. again, I'm not saying that's yeah. what I'm preferring to do. I'm just, we're, we're yeah. looking at all avenues. Yeah. That would be more towards a fixed item like that, probably, than buses. I, mean, I know that there are trans systems that have, in their history, leased buses uh, or used buses, usually to get vehicles quickly uh, to their site. But, um, I think mean, I don't even know if matching dollars can it's not be matched right. with borrowed dollars or like if you get a grant for a million dollars, you have to match it with a million. Can you match it with borrowed money? You have to show proof that you actually have the cash in hand. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Right. I'm just again looking at No, those are great questions. And those payback yeah. periods on buses would be what, 15 years if you borrowed against it? Uh, under the federal <coughs> guidelines it would be 12. 12 years. 
ours lasts longer because Henry's wonderful. Understand. Mm -hmm. But by the time his buses are ready, they've been paid off, right? Right. I mean, they, they would have been paid off. Right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right. Thank you all. I tried my best to get you out of your comfort zone. <laughs> <laughs> Again, welcome aboard. Thank you. Good to have you here. But, uh, okay, so we're going to jump down to. Uh, I, oh yeah, I guess that's a good idea. Go back to the minutes. Do we have a motion to approve? Yeah, I'll move the minutes. I'll support. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? The motion carries unanimously. Three C heavy duty vehicle list. Henry. I'm over here for the oh, first time in six years. I've never been over here before. It's uncomfortable, isn't it? We're all over here. Well, it's uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable. I'm going to try. I'm going to try it. Okay. Uh, so a little technical background. Um, our, this facility was constructed back in 2005. And specifically, if you've been out to our shop floor, we have a total of 29 work bays um, where we do vehicle repairs and inspections. Now, in reality, we only have 20 of those bays that have the that have vehicle lifts and the ability to lift the vehicles up and service them from underneath. So there's there's nine bays that we call them flat bays. They just have no lift at all, and if you can't complete a repair while the vehicle's on the ground, um, you'll have to wait for a lift to open up. So uh, the action item before you and Al Burns, our director of procurement, will go through kind of an innovative way that uh, we've uh, sought out a manufacturer of these heavy lifts. Is um, in order to keep our productivity going, remain efficient with our shop operations, because we run 24-7, 365 out there, um, we're, we're needing to purchase three additional heavy-duty lifts. Now, all of the lifts that are in our fleet shop are what people are familiar with, which we call in-ground, the two post lifts that come up and lift um, either the front or the back of the bus. Um, the lifts that we're requesting to purchase are drive-on lifts flush mounted, so there's long runways. Now, several reasons for this, and there's, there's been a change in kind of the thinking in most heavy-duty maintenance shops is the industry is moving away from in-ground lifts, several reasons. One, safety. So because it's in-ground, you have to have long, deep shafts that uh, to support the cylinders that go into the <coughs> maintenance if you have to get in there and service them you have to have confined space training and believe it or not i could not fit in the uh the well i'm too wide uh and lastly uh liability so those have fluid and even though our, our wells are sealed obviously the liability is could there be groundwater contamination so all the the, the lifts that we're asking they're all above ground surface mounted everything self-contained there's no confined spaces. That and the fact which is drive-on lifts can actually accommodate most all vehicles. As you know, we're, we're, we've got different types of vehicles. We've got older buses, newer buses, electric buses, smaller buses, um, and those have different lifting points. So when you have two in-ground in column lifts, sometimes those lifting points are a challenge to line up. So that's the technical background. I'm going to have Mr. Burns uh, kind of go through the procurement method. Uh, when Henry and I spoke about it, he uh, spoke about the need for the procurement. Um, we looked and we wanted to make sure that it was a, um, as fast a procurement process as possible. So part of the 4221F, which governs us on how we spend our federal dollars, there's a thing called the cooperative procurement, where another agency goes out and they, they do all the heavy lifting or handle the procurement. With that in mind, um, the uh, IFB was uh, was released, and it was released by the um, Delaware, Mississippi, Montana, and Oklahoma. It was under a NASPO contract. Um, nine vendors submitted bids um, for that, um, and all of the bids were accepted. Um, in January, we want to, we used that contract, but we had to get permission from the director of state purchasing for the state of Florida. Um, I received that um, approval on Ju January 16th, and then we went out and we received quotes. The quotes that we received um, was for 
$272. Um, me and my team, we entered into negotiations with Mohawk, um, and then they, they came back with a price of $453,000 for a savings of approximately $16,000. Um, we we, a part of the procurement process is to make sure that the things that um, Andrew and CLA spoke about, SAMS, SAMS.gov, EPLS, my team and I, we, we did those checks. We made sure that it was in compliance with Buy America provisions, all the F FTA provisions, and all those things were, were adhered to. Um, after that, we determined that it had, they have the capacity to perform the work, and therefore it brings us here to us today. So you really, really need these. Yeah. Um, so out of our fleet of heavy buses, we have about 210. That works out to be 10 buses per width is what we have now. Um, so if we had 10 buses down or, or even 20 buses, which we do at some times, that's how many we bring for inspection. I mean, if they were all down and needed a lift, we'd have no way to continue on. That happens. Uh, you know, we're, year, we're, we're about five days a year. We're at about 75% right now. So we, we generally have two or three open lifts to keep night shift operations going and inspections. But um, as of late, okay. it, we have to kind of juggle things. We, we obviously, that's a that's a that's a bus almost. You know, especially it is, if we're it is. a grant for an electric bus where we have to pay for half of one or half of a bus. That's a well. In this case. Uh, this project has been in our capital plan for, for a couple of years now, uh, and it was programmed for this year. So th this is a 100% federally funded project. Um, so there's there's no local component. Okay. Uh, any questions from you guys? Um, I have a motion to approve. We'll I'll move that we purchase three additional lifts from Mohawk at a cost of 454000 not to exceed 454000 Second. Director of Risk Management. Um, I'm here this afternoon to um, request approval for a settlement in the amount of 45000 <coughs> with uh, Plaintiff Charles Rivers. Uh, this claim occurred in January of 2015 when uh, our passenger tripped and fell as he was departing the bus through the front door. Liability is not in our favor on this case. Um, as a result of the fall, Mr. Rivers actually fell out of the front of the bus and injured his neck, back, and left knee. Uh, he has approximately $34,000 in medical expenses, with $24,000 of that outstanding. Uh, he did undergo surgery on his knee. Uh, we're requesting settlement authority of $45,000. We do have an agreed uh, settlement contingent upon board approval to go forward. Thank you. Um any, uh, I mean, obviously something like this is preventable. Yes. And what have we what have we done to make sure it doesn't happen again? It, it is. Um, is it a teachable thing? Well, I, I basically what happened is where the wheelchair lift is stowed at the front of the bus. Okay. Through the course of the day, dirt and debris got under it, and it caused it to, even though it was completely stowed, it did not flush. Mm -hmm. So when he was exiting the bus, he stumbled over that. He he walked with a cane anyway, um, so he was not right um, steady on his feet to start. Do we have that happen often? That not only the falling, but the, the, the not stowing. Part. I I have only seen it on this one okay. instance. And um, so that's just something that when we clean the buses, we just make sure we get that area. If, if the lift is not completely stowed, if it was up, the bus can't move away. Mm -hmm. But what can happen is sometimes the transition pieces to cover the gap, okay, through time, people step can kind of bend up just a hair where there, there's probably a corner. And if 
if you're shuffling your feet and you catch it, yes. You, I got you. But that's one of the reasons you've seen him. We've taken him to the fence many a number of injuries. Yes. We're replacing him like this. Um, yeah. And I will say also that um, Diane and her operations team have a monthly or a regular meeting where the operations folks hear about all the different accidents and talk about mitigation measures to make sure that quarterly to talk about what's Great. what's the hot topic of the quarter. Thank you. Any other questions? Motion? Move to approve. Yeah. Move to approve. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Bulk fluids. Well, there's really nothing exciting. I will put that last one under consent as well. Uh, this is an action item uh, that is mostly a procurement exercise to uh, arrange contracts for our motor oil, greases, oils, coolants, uh, diesel emission fluid. Um, so again, Mr. Burns with uh, the process. Um, we, we went out to bid for this. Um, everything was in compliance with our procurement policies. Uh, we posted it on the website. We did get a lot of competition, and I was very pleased about that. We've received seven bids, um, Rely Supply, Fleet Wig, Wayne Corporation, Best Line, Ports Consolidated, SSI Lubricants, Palmdale, and Seaboard. Uh, we did, a, uh, it was a low bid. Uh, we sent all the bids. They had to um, produce their cut sheets or their spec sheets. Henry and the maintenance staff, uh, they reviewed the spec sheets to make sure they were in compliance with what we wanted. And at, on the second page, it gives you a breakdown of the base year, the option year. And we wanted to make sure that we had option years included in this one. Um, I was pretty excited about this. I, I looked at some other agencies that used this like fluids and we ended up getting a better price than the other agencies. I think it was due to the amount of competition that we received. So um, like Henry said, it's a pretty straightforward, it's a pretty straightforward procurement. And the recommendation on this one is recommend approval of a one-year contract with one-year option with port consolidation in an amount not to exceed $245,000 in Palmdale Oil Company in an amount not to exceed $265,000 and authorize the CEO to exercise the one-year option. Once again, um, when you look at what Palmdale and Ports Consolidated, at the, tar at the top you can tell exactly what fluids um, they're going to each be getting. And, and Henry, the DEF, that's the diesel exhaust fluid, is that correct? And then the 85, and that's gear oil? Do we use any kind of synthetic? Uh, I could tell you that we are moving to semi-synthetic in our uh, diesel engines. The requirements are becoming much more strict on, uh, yeah. on the tolerances for what's tend to stick as close as we can to what the OEM specs are because those components are pretty expensive. I understand. Thank you. Do we have budgeted numbers for these? Do we have, do we, how, how, how do you feel we, yeah. Um, very good question. We do have budgeted numbers. I, I don't have them in, right in front of me. Um, but before we do any procurement, we look at what is called an independent cost estimate. And generally speaking, those are what we have budgeted before. but. Um, I can make sure that I give that to my did you, boss. Did you feel good? You said you, the competition, oh, yes. you felt good, so probably under yes, where sir. we were. Okay. Yes, sir. So I'll move approval okay. of the recommendation. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries, and that'll be on consent as well. Okay. Drug and Good afternoon. Hi there. Hi. So PSTA uh, utilizes occupational medical services uh, quite a number of ways to provide uh, employee physicals, medical evaluations, uh, and drug and alcohol uh, testing as required by quite a number of state and federal regulations. Uh, Mr. Burns can speak about the procurement we just did for these services. Um, for this one, we went out for solicitation again um, in January, and it was um, RFP, which was we requested proposals. And we sent it out to six um, direct notices to six um, individual companies. 
Um, however, we only received one proposal um, in mid-February. Um, luckily, that proposal was from a, uh, what we consider a, a very reputable company, um, Baycare Urgent Care. Um, and they, the unique component to this one from a procurement perspective or a, a panelist um, from a county perspective is they have three subcontractors on this. And two of the subcontractors are small businesses. Um, and for the for PSTA here of late, um, Brad and Debbie have, have been fortunate to allow me to go out and speak to the um, small business community. So this shows that the biz, um, that the prime contractors are looking at the small businesses and and, li and actually listening to us. Um, even though we um, received only one proposal, we did go through the regular evaluation process of that proposal. Um, the evaluation committee um, consisted of. Um, Henry Lucchese, um, Jeff Thompson, the Director of Operations, um, Theo, our uh, Director of Safety, but we have to have the subject matter experts, and that was um, Ms. O'Hare and, and Trish Collins, uh, the Director of HR and the HR Managers. Um, but below that, you'll see a matrix that shows how, how we scored that. Uh, out of 800 technical points, um, Baker scored 671 points. Uh, just to kind of drill down on that a little bit, even though Henry, Henry staff and Jeff staff, they go and they, um, they do majority of the drug testing, they're not subject matter experts. So when they read a proposal, they read it on its face value. And when we go through the actual sit down and have discussions about the proposal, that's where the subject matter extra, uh, experts, Trish and Ms. O'Hare came in and they were able to field some questions and, and the points kind of adjusted at that time. Um, the price that was offered by Baker was is $53,000 lower um, lower than budget. Now, um, before Brad looks, it, it's over five years, sir. So it's, it's about $10,000 a year, but it is, it is somewhat of a savings. Um, they have the capacity to do the work. Um, I think um, Ms. Collins would agree that they were very ecstatic are very pleased to see that bank here responded to that. Um, that 305 is over five years. Yes, sir. Is this is the 305 based on the new 15 percent drug testing requirement? And the two one-year options extensions. Yes, sir. That that is the recommendation. The formal recommendation is recommend approval of a three-year base term contract with two one-year options with Baycare Urgent Care LLC not to exceed five years or $305,000 and recommend authorizing the CEO to exercise the two one-year optional years. So the $305,000 is for three years? Five. Five years. Five years. Five years. Five years. Five years. Um, oh, no, I, I wanted to ask a, make a comment here anyway, that any time a bus is in, in some kind of accident, even if it's minor, someone is injured and that driver is by federal is required to get drug tested on, correct? Yes. Okay. So then you have a facility that probably can operate that um, after hours and so, so on and so forth. Yeah. So to me, that would be important because I believe the regs also say that uh, you have to do certain things within a certain time frame, like Absolutely. one hour. And that's where one of the subcontractors comes into play. Um, for the after hours portion, that's where the subcontractor is contracted for. Right. Yeah, but you know, it was you said it was only ten thousand dollars savings, but that's a pretty good sure. savings uh, yeah. based on budget. So yeah, it's not, a lot. I mean, it's not big dollars, but it's a good saving because of two budget. I think. And did you notice that in each of these procurements that Mr. Burns puts down what the savings is, either he negotiated or to budget? It could be because his merit evaluation is based on it. <laughs> <laughs> but he's doing a great job with his team. And he'll throw me under the bus when needed with the vendors, right? <laughs> <laughs> My boss makes me do this. <laughs> so, so I'll recommend the contract with state care uh, be approved. And I will second that. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? And that one will go under consent as well. Anything else for the good of the order? We're good. Okay. Thank you all. Appreciate it. And we are adjourned. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. <laughs> Interim chairman, please. <laughs>